Good morning, everybody. Um, so I've spent the last 10 years, I've been a, a doctor now almost 30 years, but I've spent the last 10 years as a pediatric uh, cannabis doctor. I also take care of adults. When I started my practice, it was mostly adults. But I just wanted to share with you, um, these are all uh, some patients of mine that are using multiple different cannabinoids to enhance the quality of their lives. And these include cancer patients, uh, children with genetic diseases, um, children who have had uh, issues since birth, um, and it's been really very rewarding. Here's some other kids as well. Um, if you could see the top middle photo, this is a little boy that was never supposed to walk, and he came walking into my office this year, so that's kind of amazing. The little boy all the way on your right on the top um, said mama for the first time at age six. So anybody who's worried about damaging little brains with cannabis, it doesn't happen. It appears to actually make brains move forward. So the conditions that I take care of mostly um, are here. Uh, Treatment-resistant epilepsy by far is the number one uh, condition I see in pediatrics. However, autism is coming in as a very close second. Unfortunately, I do see uh, children with cancer. Most of them are advanced cancers, metastatic, who have been giving very, uh, poor prognosis. And as you can see, the other conditions. And one of the things that's very important to understand is that many of these conditions have an underlying root cause of endocannabinoid deficiency or dysfunction. Uh, some of the literature is, is bearing out that these children clearly have um, an endocannabinoid deficiency, and I know there's going to be a talk on autism, but just in March of this year, Stanford University published a paper where children uh, with autism had um, significantly lower anandamide levels uh, when compared to children who were what we call neurotypical. So when a child is missing a compound in their brain that's supposed to uh, promote homeostasis, I consider it malpractice not to correct that imbalance. Um, here, the rationale for use, again, evidence of the endocannabinoid system is root cause. Despite uh, a, a recent, uh, very recent, just this past Thursday, there was a article published in New England Journal of Medicine about medical marijuana for chronic pain, and there was a pro and a con. And the con said, uh, we don't know the safety baloney. We know the safety of cannabis, thousands of years. Show me the bodies. Um, it, we don't see that. So um, certainly tolerated well by most. We don't see organ damage. The only time I really get concerned is when it's combined with certain pharmaceuticals, especially in children with epilepsy. No question that the quality of life of these children are being improved if they respond. And we do see like around an 80% response rate, which is pretty good. Uh, certainly compassionate care, end of life. Now that we have tested medicine, and there has always been tested medicine, it just wasn't required here in California, but now everything that's on the market is, is pretty, uh, is, is compliant with testing. I don't have to worry anymore. I can get a batch result and I can see what is in uh, the, the compounds that the families are using. And most importantly with cannabis medicine, it's not a one size fits all. You can customize treatment. Um, I will share with you, these are uh, two children, uh, the little boy on the bottom, these are siblings by the way, and the mom sends me these nice little milestone updates. Um, the first day of first grade for Casey on top and her brother started third grade. These are both children uh, with epilepsy and autism. They had terrible quality of life. Um, uh, they're both on different regimens and both as you can see are in school and um, they look pretty happy doing really well. Um, I had this really cool animation where when I clicked the button, the little uh, circles came up, but I lost that when I converted this to a PDF. So what I'm using in, uh, in terms of cannabinoids for patients is I am using everything that is circled. So I am using CBD extracts, THC extracts, the raw cannabinoids, THCA, CBDA. We're also using just newly available Delta-8 THC for some teenagers with anxiety. Um, so all of these, and, and by the way, some other compounds are available. CBN, which I haven't really used very much. I haven't found very good success. Maybe other people have. Uh, THCV is now uh, currently available in California. Access to all the different cannabinoids is extremely important. I have some patients on five different extracts a day, multiple times throughout the day. Some people take certain uh, uh, cannabinoids in the morning and some take at night, but without the ability to customize or to have these available, and you know, I often get asked to talk to families who are out of state, if they don't have access, sometimes we really can't get anywhere with the condition.
So let's talk about CBD extracts. As Dr. Mishula mentioned this morning, of course, anticonvulsant, and uh, that's been borne out in multiple studies now. We also know that CBD extracts can help with anxiety and aggression, and SIB is self-injurious behavior. Certainly analgesic. Um, my own mother is using CBD uh, for uh, severe arthritis pain. That's been very successful for three years. She's been able to not take any other painkillers. Uh, neuroprotection. Even in the patients that I take care of, like the children who may not respond with a great result with epilepsy, the parents still want to continue to give CBD to their children. Despite that it's not lowering seizures, they feel that it's protecting their child's brain and they're seeing that their child isn't losing memory every time that they have a seizure. Uh, we also know CBD to be anti-cancer and in general uh, decreases neuroexcitation. Interestingly, remember CBD uh, is a stimulant in low doses and it's more sedating in higher doses. And of course this varies a lot of inter individual variation, but I have found in the autistic population that sometimes the lower doses actually aggravate behavior and as we go higher in dose, we can actually get an opposite effect, which is a more calming effect. Sometimes that turns people off. They may try CBD for their child, and usually in a very low dose, they see their child escalate behavior, and then they're terrified to use CBD anymore. Uh, but remember, these compounds are biphasic, so we're gonna see an opposite effect. I like to divide the CBD into two types of compound, or kind of uh, categories, high ratio CBD to THC and lower ratio. CBD to THC, and as you can see, I've listed some ratios. Those are not the only ratios that we use, but that is just uh, an example. And the reason I do this is because I find that people often say, oh, okay, I got some CBD. Well, is it CBD with a one-to-one -one or CBD like a 27-to-one? Because if it's, they're going to give you different effects and you cannot compare the two of them. And if you don't know what you're doing and you buy a one-to-one -one ratio and you go home and you dose it by CBD and you get stoned, you're gonna be a little bit turned off to that if you're not looking for that effect. So um, I do like to categorize at least again reading labels so that you understand what is in the product that you're using. In children, I've listed the five most common terpenes that seem to be helpful for both seizures and for autism, linalool, pinene, limonene, beta caryophyllin, and myrcene. So raw cannabinoids uh, have been available now for a number of years in California. I find that both of them are anticonvulsant um, in my clinical experience, anti-inflammatory, and also in pediatric patients, this list of improvements that we're seeing, which is decreased anxiety, improved focus, uh, better speech, less stimming in those children that have uh, autism, better sleep, better appetite, less aggression. Uh, this is a picture of Catherine. Catherine came to me many years ago. She's one of my first pediatric patients, and when I gave her CBD, because uh, that's what was available at the time. We had THC and we had CBD extracts. She did terribly. She didn't even last two uh, weeks on CBD oil. Her seizures were escalated. She was on three medications. We thought maybe there's a drug interaction that we weren't accounting for, but her family was completely turned off to it and they were not willing to um, even uh, go and move any further with it. And about a year later, I noticed her name on my schedule. And when they came in, the mom said, you know, we tried two more pharmaceuticals and we were not getting anywhere. Um, she was having a significant number of seizures every week and tremendous anxiety related. She felt every seizure coming, so we call that an aura, and it would create tremendous anxiety for her, which then created tremendous anxiety in the family. And when she came back to see me, we had some new uh, information about THCA, and so we started her on that, and she had about 30% reduction of seizures and complete resolution of the auras. So the mother said the quality of life was tremendously improved. And when CBDA became available, we added that into the regimen. And right now, I'll tell you, she's 50% reduced on seizures. She's been able to wean off a very difficult drug called Omphi that's uh, almost impossible to wean off of. And she's had no rebound seizures from the weaning. And in general, her quality of life has really been improved. And again, that's just on raw cannabinoids. She doesn't take CBD or THC. All right, THC extracts, you know, I read something about somebody saying that uh, ch children, of course, don't use THC. No, they do. In my practice, they do. Um, I do find that there, it is an added anticonvulsant effect for some patients. I, in fact, have one patient who the only thing that works to stop his seizures is THC. If you were gonna design a drug for a child who may need to be on this 
medication for long term. THC um, may develop tolerance over time, so it's not the greatest, but what we found with this patient is that we've got the seizures so well controlled that we can back up a little bit on some days, skip a dose, maybe take a break for a day, and then restart to try to keep the tolerance down. In general, though, the child has no intoxica intoxication. He's at a pretty low dose, uh, but it's made a big difference in his seizures. Um, I also find THC to be very helpful when weaning the pharmaceuticals. AED stands for anti-epilepsy drugs. Also, what parents will tell us, and remember, if your child has an andamide deficiency or an endocannabinoid deficiency, giving THC can help replace that deficiency. And so what we are seeing is improvements reported in you know, focused speech, less stimming, better sleep, better appetite, decreased anxiety. I find THC in general to be very well tolerated. One of the things I explain to every family is that every person has a ceiling dose. And what we do is we start extremely low and we titrate up. If, you, if they see their child starting to have any kind of intoxicating effects, we've now hit the ceiling dose and the goal is really to stay under that, of course. We're not, we're not looking to intoxicate children. So the low concentration products, five milligrams per ml and 10 milligrams per ml, everything in basically standardized one ml syringe, which is easy to measure and give to a child, um, I find allows us to explore THC in very low accurate doses with uh, very little unwanted effects. Now, CBG is fairly new on the market. CBG stands for cannabigerol, and I have to thank um, a group called Whole Plant Access for Autism, and there's, they have a poster and a booth, so definitely check them out. I'm on their advisory board. There's a nonprofit group that helps families with autism. There's over 8,000 families involved with them. They pointed out to me that CBG was out on the market and there were some families using it. So I delved into the research, and I'm not gonna go through it all since time is limited, but if can take a picture and then take a look at these articles. But what's interesting is that CBG appears to work at different mechanisms than, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the other compounds. And uh, what we're finding, and let me show you this slide, is that they did a survey of 35 families, and as you can see, the dominant effects in these 35 families of children with autism were mostly beneficial. So you can see 31 out of 35 of the children had better mood. Um, increase in speech, decrease in anxiety, increase in focus, increase in social interaction, decrease in hyperactivity, increase in sleep, better appetite, decrease in some pain. That's kind of amazing that, that when you look at the top half of this um, uh, graph, you can see that the dominant effects in this particular group of patients is uh, quite beneficial. And what we're finding with CBG is it is an antidepressant, anti-anxiety, definitely changes mood also works as an analgesic and anti-inflammatory. So I have started using this in patients. Many of the patients are combining it with other cannabinoids. And again, I mentioned this yesterday um, at a Q&A that I attended. Um, and that combination cannabinoids uh, seems to uh, be very helpful for these children who have um, such devastating illness. In terms of dosing CBG, it appears to be fairly low dose, between two and 20 milligrams per day. It can be stimulating for some, so some of these patients were only doing it in the morning because if they take it in the evening, they will um, stay up all night, which is, of course, opposite of what we're interested in. Um, and there is a report of a young adult that was shared through me uh, through this uh, Facebook group who had Tourette syndrome, and he decided to try low doses all the way up to about 100 milligrams, and he found uh, that he had complete resolution of his tics between 25 and 40 milligram dose. So it's very interesting um, in that, um, in my experience with most patients with Tourette, you have to have a fair amount of THC, and he does supplement with THC, but in this way he might be able to use both so he doesn't have to take as much THC. And so I, I got through it, so I have plenty of time for questions. Good morning, um, Dr. Goldstein. Thank you for your work and your presentation. Um, is there a suppository of information that helps with pediatrics um, weaning from certain synthetics, uh, other sort of pharmaceutical drugs? Or are you finding it more just specific to specific diseases that you've spoken about? Uh, so in pediatrics, the, the drugs that we're mostly weaning from are uh, uh, anti-seizure drugs, or sometimes the children are taking uh, either Abilify or, or Respiral for autism. 
All of these drugs are usually very difficult to get off of. Um, in general, what I've learned is that you know different doctors learn different things. There's no one absolute way. In fact, one of my friends who's a neurologist said he, he was taught a certain way um, in one program and then he went to another program and they taught him a different way to do it. So I do think it's really a physician's uh, preference. In general, I tell patients, uh, if they're, especially if they're doing well with cannabis medicine, not to go fast, don't rock the boat once we're actually seeing some good results. So I tell patients to, to wean 10% or less um, over a period of somewhere between two and four weeks to do it slowly, especially as we move up on the cannabinoid treatment, we can kind of go slowly down. There's no reason to rip away drugs from a child who's actually finally got some stability. Mm -hmm. That's my approach anyway. Okay, thank you. Sure. Two minutes remaining. Hi there, my question is about the CBG. I know that yesterday at the CME uh, talks that we had, um, cannabinoids were uh, suggested in place, or in, without THC, so to speak, or um, for those that have schizophrenia or bipolar. And uh, on that slide, CBG seems that it was also a, a possibility for improvement of antidepressant and anxiety. Uh, do you have any um, negative s side effects for CBG with schizophrenia or bipolar that you know of right now? So I haven't, I've only treated one bipolar patient with CBG who was already a patient doing well on a CBD dominant oil. When we added in CBG, she felt that it was actually helping her more in combination in terms of complete elimination of the ang like kind of paralyzing anxiety that she still had breakthroughs uh, with. I have not treated anybody with schizophrenia with CBG, but I, th I certainly think it would be interesting to try. Was that patient on any antipsychotic medications as no, well? No, it was None. a patient who had already weaned off all pharmaceuticals and was doing well on cannabis. Thank you. We've got 10 seconds, Bonnie. Okay. Uh, in your regimen and uh, dosing uh, recommendations to children uh, in your THC versus THC acid, One minute. THCA, uh, how do you really go about determining uh, that spread between the acid part and the THC molecule? Right, so you know, there's a huge inter-individual variation. Everybody responds differently. So in general, I use the same kind of motto that everybody uses, which is start low and titrate up. And of course, remember, this is out of pocket medicine and can be quite expensive. So what we're trying to do is find the lowest dose to give the desired effect. So pretty much with THC, I'm starting usually at a half a milligram to a milligram per, d per day or per dose, depending on the condition. And for THCA, I would say it's probably two milligrams or sometimes even under that for a patient with epilepsy. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody.